It's a blessing to be with you all this morning. I, um, I've got to say, this church has a lot of talent. It's, uh, it's exciting to see. One of the privileges I have of uh, filling in for pastors that are gone and speaking at different churches, you, you get a good feel for what's happening. And uh, I tell you, the most exciting part of the service so far for me is these young kiddos. Uh, not only are they here, they're participating. And that is such a rarity to see. And uh, you just don't know, maybe you do, but you're blessed. You're very blessed. But it is a privilege to be with y'all this morning. You can turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 12, Luke 12, and just put your finger there. We'll get there in a little bit. I'd like to open up in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank You for everything that we've heard this morning, Lord, the songs of worship that have been lifted up to You, Lord. We give You praise and honor. Lord, we thank You for everything that You have done for us, the blessings that You've bestowed upon us. Lord, we just recognize Your presence here. And Lord, I just pray that You speak in and through me, Lord, that You would give me Your words, not mine. And Lord, that we would receive it, apply it to our hearts and lives, and we go out into the community to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Of course, in your name I pray. Amen. How many of you have been in Delta County, say, 15 years? Okay. I want to say I really do appreciate it because y'all were my employer in my career for about two years. I had the privilege of serving as chief deputy here in Delta County under Sheriff Gerald Teague. So uh, I had a good time being here and serving. I had a 22-year career in law enforcement. And I'm going to be talking to you. It just amazes me. I was sitting here just uh, meditating and listening to the songs, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me that the Spirit goes before us. Um. I, I've been in prayer for about uh, 10 days now on what message to present. And all the songs, as you see as I go, just flow with what we're going to be discussing today. But in opening, I'd like to say the world in which we live is radically different than the world that I grew up in. Would you not agree? I was born in 1964. We moved to Hopkins County in 1970. I started the first grade, graduated Sulphur Springs High School, class of 82. Those times were bad enough. I never thought in my lifetime that we would see the things that we're seeing today. If you live today and you hold a conservative let's say, worldview. You can be counseled by society overnight. There's been many of people that have stood up for conservative values and the news just blasts them, crucifies them, social media beats on them, puts them down. You could wake up and be unemployed because of something that you stand for that you hold dear to. Maybe you know someone or maybe you yourself has taken a position and have felt this council culture that we live in. There's a definition that's been given to this movement in our world, in our country today. It's a phenomenon in which those who are deemed to have acted are spoken in an unacceptable manner, are ostracized, boycotted, and shunned. Have you seen it? Have you experienced it? Our world today is a picture of what the prophet Isaiah said in his book in chapter 5, verse 20. He said this, he was looking out over the city of Jerusalem and he said this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. 
who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Is that not a 100% accurate view of our world today? You look at it, you turn on whatever your choice of media is, you see it. They celebrate evil. They criticize good. In my career in law enforcement, I had a front row seat to evil. I retired as chief deputy in Raines County. I call it TDC Raines for short. Because there's a lot of crime there. I investigated crimes that would just make your head spin round and round. How could this even happen in Texas, much less the United States of America? Evil is real. If we don't recognize that, we are behind the eight ball and we've got our head in the sand. But that's the worldview. That's the world that we live in today. Sadly, the issue is not only in the world. It has infiltrated the church. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about this beautiful facility that you have. This is the church house. I'm talking about you. It's infiltrated the church so much that it has made a lot of us, not all, let me clarify, but a lot of us afraid to take a stand and speak boldly about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just think this. When you start to have a little depression or a little anxiety about this culture, the wokeism, the council culture and all that, this is nothing new for God's people. You'll find it from cover to cover in this book, Council Culture. All through the Old Testament, the world was in opposition of God's chosen people through captivity, death, destruction, bondage. Can't get more counseled than that. Jesus Himself faced cancel culture. It's not new. The hard-hearted, the hypocritical religious leaders of His day continually sought to cancel Him. Ultimately, they arrested Him and nailed Him to the cross. They thought they had canceled Him. So, when we look at the news and we see this canceled culture, and, we, and I've had these talks, what is the world coming to? I, I just can't believe the evil. But I want to focus primarily on an example about what I'm referring about inside the church. I want to talk about how Satan has destroyed our message from what it should be for fear of us being seen as intolerant, judgmental, homophobic, racial, exclusive, a hate monger, you get the picture. All these names that are thrown out there upon you and me. But there's something that we must understand and remember about Jesus' message. I hear this a lot. We focus on the love of Christ, which would you agree is a good statement? Christ is love. But sometimes we have a different dictionary for that definition. As believers, as children of God, we have to remind ourselves that Jesus did not come to bring 
peace. And a lot of times when you say that, people's hair kind of bristles up. All the Christmas carols, all that stuff. Peace, goodwill towards man. Side note, that peace is only available in a relationship with Him. That's the only ones that can possess it. Let's look in Luke chapter 12... And here, if you have a red letter edition, you're going to see a lot of red. What does that indicate? Our Savior's words. And Luke 12 is going to show us that Jesus did not come to bring peace on earth. He came to bring fire and division. Luke 12, and we're going to start in verse 49. I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? Question mark. I tell you not at all, but rather division. For from now on five in one house will be divided, three against two, and two against three. Father will be divided against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Oh, wait a minute. What do we have here? What is he referring to? Bringing fire and division. Almighty God in His foreknowledge knew He had a plan. He was going to bring Himself, the incarnate Christ, to fix the problem of the fall. But He knew that not all would accept and believe. And those that became believers and accepted that atonement, do you know of anybody in your family or friends where someone has been born again, radically born again, and the division that it brings in amongst the lost in that family. I've seen people of other faiths where Christ has reached down and touched one, and they become born again, and they have been kicked out of the home, kicked out of the family. That's division. He came to bring fire and division. But I want to narrow this focus down a little bit more. I want to get down to just one simple word. I have pastor friends who I've known have been invited to speak at different congregations. They've preached their heart out and they've spoken this Word based upon Scripture, from Scripture. And then after the service, the pastor would come up and say, we don't use that Word. It's too divisive. It divides. It's too harsh. It's unloving. We want to be loving to everybody. What is that word? Turn with me just to Luke chapter 13 and we'll discover this word together. Chapter 13. You got those up on the board? One through five. There we present at the season some who told him about the Galileans who blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, letters in red, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. 
But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Have you located the word? It's in there twice. Repent. Or repentance. That word is the word that some pastors, some church members are afraid to say to their family and friends, their co-workers, because it's too harsh. It is so unloving. You're passing judgment on someone. Does that sound familiar? I ask you this question. The letters are in red. Is Jesus being unloving to this audience? Is He? I would say, I would put it this way, that Jesus is love. The Scripture tells us Jesus is love. But Jesus is being truthful. He says, I am the way, the what? Truth, and the what? Life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Our triune God. One God. Three persons. I say the word perish is the most, or repent, and repentance is the most loving word that you could use. Jesus told us this in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world, even to the council culture, and preach the gospel to every creature. That gospel message has to be based upon repentance, this one word. Repentance is mentioned over 950 times in Scripture. Do you think it's crucial? Actually, the number is 968. Without repentance, you cannot, you cannot be born again. I want to say that again. Without this word, without this action, it is impossible for anyone to become born again through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wow, preacher, that's harsh. That is so unloving. Well, let's keep on. Let's focus more on this word. Let's dig down. You know, in law enforcement, we had to dig down to make a case. We had to put all, gather all the facts. Look at everything and come to a conclusion. Well, let's dig down a little bit further on this word. So what is repentance? To understand what repentance is, we must first understand what it is not. You, you take the excess, you get rid of it. Okay, repentance is not what? So we can understand what it is. Repentance, number one, is not the conviction of sin alone. I want to repeat that. Repentance is not the conviction of sin alone. Number two, it's not the confession of sin. You say, well, wait a minute. That doesn't really seem right. Well, let's look back to the book of Exodus Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. You remember the story of the plagues that Pharaoh was undergoing? 
Well, let's see what Pharaoh had to say in Exodus chapter 9, verses number 27 and 28. It says, And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, now catch these words, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and my people and I are wicked. Entreat me, the Lord, that there may be no more mighty thundering in hell, for it is enough. I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. He admitted he was a sinner. He admitted he was evil. He confessed that. But if you keep reading the story, after Moses went to the Lord and the hell stopped, he backed out. He reneged on his promise. There was no follow through. So conviction and confession alone is not enough. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 28, the book of Proverbs. You notice I like a lot of Scripture. Proverbs 28, verse number 13. It says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes, then will have mercy. Confession and forsakes. Conviction and confession is not enough. The third thing is the contrition of sin or the sorrow of sin is not enough. Did you know in the Bible there are two types of sorrow? Let's look to 2 Corinthians and see what the Apostle Paul says. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 10. We find this. If I can get to second instead of first. 7 verse 10. For godly sorrow produces what? Repentance. Leading to what? Salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow from the world produces death. So we have two different types of sorrow. You can be under conviction of your sin. You can be a person that will confess your sin. And you can be sorrowful for that sin. But is it worldly sorrow or godly sorrow? There's a difference. So we know that repentance is not those things. So what is repentance? Repentance is this. It's the conviction of sin, the contrition of sin or being sorry for that sin, the confession of the sin, then the conversion from the sin. The Greek word for repentance means to turn away. To turn away. Let's go back to Ezekiel, back in the Old Testament. We get a good picture of this in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 14.6 says this, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, here's that word, Repent, Turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. Did you catch that? Turn away. Repentance, guys, is the key to belief, to faith in Christ, and to be regenerate, born again. It has to have repentance. 
It has to have repentance. It's a supernatural act from God. A transformation from the old man to the new man. It's a divinely provided radical change of attitude and action from sin toward a new relationship with Almighty God containing a strong desire for obedience to God above all. And when I say God, I'm talking about the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you have not repented, but you've had the other three things, check yourself. Test. It's the most crucial thing that you will ever do. It has everlasting impact on your life. The Bible gives us some illustrations of what true repentance is and what it looks like. It gives us specific stories. How many have heard of a wee little man? Zacchaeus. Such a wee little man. Climbed up in the sycamore tree. After encountering Jesus... What did he do? He made restitution for the fraud he committed as part of his occupation. Would you say that's a radical change? That's radical. He tried to make it right with those he offended because he was a new creation. Then there's another character in the Bible. The Apostle Paul. Preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. A learned man that sat under some of the best Greek philosophers and teachers in the world could not stand. He despised the Christians and their God. You remember Stephen, the first martyr of the faith? Paul was sitting there holding the cloaks of those that stoned him. He was so radically changed when he met our Lord and Savior. He answered the call, he was radically changed. Onesimus, you remember him in Philemon, the runaway slave. What did he do? He had an encounter with Christ. What did he do? He went right back to his master because he was in the wrong. They say, well, that's pretty radical. Yeah, pretty radical. If you truly have met our Lord, there will be a radical change in your life. Does it mean that you're going to be perfect? That you're always going to be in a step in obedience? No, far from it. But when you go out as a believer and you sin, direct disobedience to God. If you do not have Pardon me for the evasive space here. If you do not have this happen when you sin and you're disobedient, if you do not have the Spirit of the living God immediately doing this right here, that's not my way. That's not our way. And you do not become under conviction, you need to check yourself. Something's missing. That is one of the most solid proofs of a true believer that there is. Is that you have that conviction immediately when you're in disobedience to His Word. When you step out of line. If you don't have that, please check yourself. 
So you say, why is repentance necessary? Well, let's turn to 2 Peter right quick. 2 Peter chapter 3. It's a beautiful verse. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. It says this, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to what? Sorrow? Conviction? Confession? Repentance. Come to repentance. There's a lot of people that are sorry for getting caught. I saw that in law enforcement. They were sorry to get caught and they would go before the judge with big old crocodile tears. I'll never do it again. I'll never do it again. Show mercy, show mercy. I feel myself at the mercy of the court. We put you on probation. And we arrest them the next week. No change. Worldly sorrow. But I've been in courtrooms before to where there's been a fellow believer, a brother or sister in Christ that has been offended severely. And see them get up in the court and plead for mercy for the one that offended them. And you ought to see the courtroom. Is this for real? Wow. If my child was done like that, there's no way I could show mercy. He killed my husband. There's no way I could show him mercy. If you've truly repented, God granted you mercy. And the supernatural Holy Spirit that lives within you gives us that ability to grant mercy to those that have offended us, to show Christ. Do, do I say that I'm not for justice? No. I'm for worldly justice. If not, we would have chaos. But you can extend grace and mercy. You can be a testimony. You can have peace in the middle of the storm. There's that word peace. Jesus didn't come to give the world, world, Peace. He come to stir the pot. He stirred it. But He brings peace to those in the midst of the storm that repent and turn and follow Him. We are to be different. We must be different in this culture. Guys, the most important thing is your loved ones that you feel that are lost. <coughs> your co-workers. God has got you where He wants you. He has given you a circle, a mission field. Are you going to be bold and be truly loving by saying, look, I once was lost. I'm found. I had to come to a place when I used to party with you. When we used to do this and do that. I don't do those things anymore. And my life is so peaceful. Let me share my Jesus with you. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to come inside these four walls as beautiful as this building is, as talented as these musicians are, as friendly as y'all are. This is a place of refuge and refueling for the believers. What are you refueling for? To face the council culture. The wokeness. 
without fear of losing your job, losing your reputation, losing your status, losing your home, losing that new vehicle, that new four-wheeler, that new rifle, whatever it is. God, you gave it to me. You can take it away. I want to do your will. I want to be faithful to your commandment to go out and preach the gospel to all preachers. Start where you're at. But here's the sad truth of all this. I want to start wrapping it up. There are a lot of individuals, and listen to my words carefully, there's a lot of individuals church members that are no longer attending. Does that fit this church? Do you remember people that used to come 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago that no longer come or go to another fellowship of believers? They're they're out. And you strike up a conversation with them and they say things like this and see if you've heard it before. Well, I think I'm okay. I went to church many years ago. I went forward and they led me through this little prayer and man, I got baptized. Or they'll say something like this. I believe in the Bible and what it says about sin and Jesus and all that stuff, the man upstairs. Guys, that's not enough. Jesus says on Judgment Day, O you workers of iniquity, depart from me. I never knew you. But Lord, didn't we cast out devils? Didn't we do this for you? Didn't we do that for you? Depart from me, I never knew you. What was missing? True repentance. True repentance. As we stand, I want to leave you with this verse in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. This is Jesus speaking to the persecuted church. It says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Are you listening? Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. It is my prayer that you have life. You've experienced true repentance and you have life in Jesus Christ. If the Lord is dealing with you in a certain way, take this opportunity to come forward. There are pretty sure men of this church, women of this church that come, tell you about repentance, pray with you. I would be glad to as we sing.